Walk on the Pigeon River Farm, doing farming right. I'm Robert Brown, the owner of Pigeon River Farm. Thank you for viewing. Well, hello. In today's episode, we're going to talk about the hybrid pra tractor project. It's moved along quite a ways. We, are, we had a focus group here, and I got a lot of input from farmers on a lot of the strategy with this. Uh, we now have the high-powered Warp 9 motor here. Uh, so that's getting ready to be fitted. End of this week, it's going to be heading over to the weld shop. I've been working with the fabricator, so we know exactly what we're going to do as far as mounting the battery racks at both sides. Uh, working with a machine shop here to get our pulley arrangement set up. So we're going to be mounting, and now of course not this pulley, but we're going to be mounting a large diameter twin B-series belt. Uh, dry pulley here and then another pulley of course to the motor and after I did all my calculations we ended up with a four to one ratio so we're going to need a, a pulley diameter that is one-fourth the size of this driven to get the ratios correct to get the motor at its peak so it matches the RPM of what the engine would put and stay within that peak torque curve and remember, this is going to be a dead stall, we'll call it that way. When it starts, it's going to be a direct drive. So that motor will start up, direct drive to the belt pulley assembly into the transmission. And based on what gear I am, that's the rate at which it will accelerate up to what I would call base idle of the engine. As we move along, I will be explaining more and you'll have a chance to see it start to come together. But at this stage of the game, what I'm doing is we've got, we've got all of the knowledge and input from a variety of different experts. I've taken that, I've compiled it into a project model that I've now put together. And as I said, if the tractor is heading off to the uh, weld shop, uh, once I get it back from the weld shop, then the fabrication will start here. I'm working with my dear friend who is an engineer I actually got two of them, and one is be working on the electronics, the other one's helping with the high current area. We are building our own controller, so we'll keep you posted on that. So we're not buying an aftermarket controller, we're building our own high-powered motor controller that to integrate into the system. And in uh, future videos, what I'll do is I'll explain the reasoning we chose to go that route versus buying an off-the-shelf controller. So I thank you very much. I hope you enjoy. Here's some uh, additional video uh, on things that we were doing, or a little bit of our, our meeting, uh, a little bit of getting this thing all cleaned up and looking pretty for uh, when it leaves. So our big issue is not breaking things. Yes. Yeah, because it, yeah, this is it's more uh, <coughs> torque monster. Yeah, it's a torque monster. Yeah. But that's as long as you don't feed it too much current, you won't get too much torque. Yeah. So. And it also makes it for longevity because you're, you know, this kind of falls into how the tractor is designed, then it might be a two or three X over, yeah. over design. Yeah. That can take the heat, you know, that's one of the beauties of this thing, is for that long continuous. Uh, he's the one who convinced me, it didn't take a lot of convincing, I wanted to start 48. <laughs> 72, and he fought me like there was no tomorrow. The point that I didn't want to talk to him is how the way it is. He says, You're going to do 72. He says, This thing is not going to be a very successful project. You get 144. So yeah, that's your bare minimum. Percentage. That's where he feels, yeah. Because your efficiency, when you've got that low voltage, think about the, you want it around 6 volt, 6 volt versus 12. You really want, you know, would you really want 6 volt on anything? I mean, these tractors are six volt, everybody updates them to 12. It's just not a thing. Well, he, the same argument he makes is, except for toys like golf carts and little things, 40, 36, 48 is okay. He said, you're not doing a lot of work. He says, some of you are gonna do work. He said, some of these guys build these electric cars at 72 volt, and they just regret it. Oh, so I gotta go from a 3.8 stud with that style cable to little MOSFET transistors. Little, but they're big, but they just got flat, little, high quality steel. 
little legs out. That's the, little, the, little, the three little three-legged ones you see laying on the boards. They're usually square. These will be pretty big. big. But um, is that is the biggest problem. So what the plan is, is to take a piece of brass. He's going to take, he's got to get rid of the heat. And so we're going to have, well, we're building our own controller. You know, that will be kind of the last thing we'll talk about here. Is Eric and I are designing a controller. So we're going to have the low voltage portion of the 12 volt. There's very little work. Just going to, it turns on and off the controllers, gets all the input signals and so on. <clears throat> And then we're taking and making a separate box that's probably going to be sitting on top of where the batteries go here. There'll be a separate box built. And that is going to only job it's going to be is to take this big block of aluminum with a block of copper. And we're looking for a block of something maybe six by six or six by four that's maybe three eighths or better thickness. Copper is amazing. Heat sink. I mean, the ability for copper to take away heat is What's quite. What's the difference between aluminum and copper? Uh, I don't remember the factor, but it's 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 enough to make a big difference. And if you tie the two together, you have the best of both worlds. Because because of the remember what that transistor is, it's very isolated. If you put it on, because think of the porosity, the pores, porosity. Thank you. The porosity of the aluminum plate. That's where the problem comes in. So if you have that. Uh, isolated heat, specifically on aluminum, it can't get rid of the heat fast enough. It's kind of like foamy water. You put, you're putting that stuff on it or whatever. Dielectric grease, right? yeah. Uh, well, real high temperature stuff. But we'll, if we can go to copper, and then copper immediately goes to uh, aluminum. Oh, interesting. Yeah. What they normally do with some of these is they actually have a mini radiator. Yep, yep. They actually take and put a little, like a transmission cooler and a little pump, and then they have a, the one, one company actually makes one with a manifold that actually has all these channels in it specifically so it's going to be by the transistors and it takes the coolant and, and flows it away. This old tap, push the clutch in, no PTO, no hydraulics and I and I got around the hydraulics that was another thing that I had my brain twisting on and I was looking like putting on an extra pump because this is set up with the uh, live hydraulics here. So this has got live hydraulics, I took the old belly pump that a dumb decision to do. The old belly pump turned into a reservoir. I just gutted the pump out of it, and it's now it's just simply so that's located right here, and that is just simply where the hydraulic oil sits to run the this. Well, now this engine's going to be off. I still need to run the power steering, and I still need to run the three point. So I was like, okay, uh, auxiliary pump, you know, belt, the chain. I was going through all that. Put that belly pump back together again, because that is a that is live when the transmission is turning. With when the transmission is turning, when this is turning, he had a little rubs on this thing. But again, I won't have much at low speed. I will be kind of limited on the RPM of the pump. You know, I guess here that's true with anything there. But it there is a couple little wrinkles. This can go to three thousand. Your belly pump, I think, is 1,200. Yeah. No, but I've studied the uh, uh, gauge on there. Oh, it is so rare. The only time I ever see the, the power steering is like a couple, 300, 400 psi. Uh, I see that, and then the only time I get is when I actually dead head the, the ramp. Normally, if I'm lifting something that this tractor could lift, it's in the hundreds of psi range. So I don't think I'll have any problems. And I thank you so much, and have a most wonderful day.